I'm gonna do like an intro. Mm-hmm. Have you have you listened to the show before? So I haven't listened I, to any of yours. I think I, I know. I was thinking about that. Like we don't listen to each other's shit. Yeah. Um, maybe because <laughs> we like know, we like, like talk too much talk as too it much. is. Uh, my guest today is the writer behind PushingBeauty.com. She's a breathwork teacher, author of the upcoming book, The Bright Side of a Broken Heart. Podcaster, Instagrammer, blogger. She's a Twitterer, Facebooker, and she's my sister. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle Diavella is in the building. Whoop. This is the Ground Up Show, episode 22. <laughs> I'm getting good with that. Pretty good. That was good, right? Yeah, and like the music's legit. Yeah, yeah, I, I like the music too. I need some help with my podcast soon. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't know. If this might, music's not really licensed, so I'm probably going to get sued. <laughs> uh, the guy's name is Passion Hi-Fi, so check him out. Uh, he gives away like uh, music for free on, uh, I think it's mostly for YouTube videos, but uh, I'm kind of repurposing it for podcasts slash YouTube videos. I'm sure you'd be happy to get a shout out. Probably not. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> That's a whole, such a very strange world, yeah. which uh, most people don't care about or even look into is like the licensing of content. Yeah. And Unless you're a musician or producer. Right. And then you do look into that stuff. <laughs> yeah. But I know somebody who used to work at one of these old, like the licensing companies that's mm-hmm. still around today. And he's like, they don't, they don't. Uh, have legal teams that go out and try to find people to sue them over using copyrighted really? stuff. Yeah, but I think the art if the artist found it, then you might get in trouble. Right. So uh, anyway, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, are you first excited? LA or I know you're the Angelino. first first person here in LA. Uh, last episode was my friend Jesse, who you know. I met Jesse um, in Brooklyn and. It's been a while since I've recorded an episode. It's been like three to four weeks, but yeah. it's good to get back into get the back grind. Into it. Well, because I didn't, I didn't have anywhere to do it. And um, as you know, uh, I'm helping Josh and Ryan start up a podcasting studio, uh, but like that might not be open and ready for another three to four months. Yeah, got to make do. Show must go on. So we're in our dining room. It's pretty uh, nice dining room. It's not. It's not setup. bad. It's okay. It's really not great. <laughs> Honestly, like if you look back at the other episodes, yeah. I think the the visual is a little bit better. Even though, well, I'm interested to see what the lighting looks like too, because your other space was just darker, and I mean, there's lights right here, so it'll be interesting to see if it's a little bit lighter and brighter. I don't like, like LA that. Is. See, I don't. You yeah, want it to feel dark and gloomy. I, <laughs> it, yeah, not dark and gloomy. I like living in a very bright apartment. This mm-hmm. apartment is like leaps. Uh, above what we were living in just because there's so much natural light um it's just very it's more updated Mm -hmm. like my old apartment or our our old apartment would have these wood splinters sticking out and i would like be like happy and like (gasps) sliding across the floor like really excited about my day and then i would hit one of these splinter i would get splinters one inch deep into my foot you know what that's called that's called karma (laughs) why because i was so happy about life because i have a childhood story okay so when i was like five no i must have been a little bit older than that because you would have been way too young so you're like three and a half, four years younger than me. So when I was young and you were old enough to be around, I was on the back deck. So I remember the back deck had like crazy splinters. Like it was like, to- mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember when we were kids, that back deck had like tons of splinters. And I was like running outside to like go play in the yard and got a huge splinter like the size of my foot. And I was sobbing outside, like screaming. And you come running out, you and Mark come running out. And you guys are like, what's wrong? And I'm like, go get mom, go get mom. You're like, okay. And you guys go inside and you start playing video games. <laughs> and I was outside, which I don't know why I didn't think to like get up and hop yeah. into the house or something, but I cried until hard grandma came out. <laughs> I, I mean, Mario is a hell of a drug and, and it, it's Mario hard to, to say no to Mario. Uh, apologize for that. <laughs> Apparently you've been yeah. holding a grudge for the past like yes, 25 years. Just waiting years. for this podcast to shut um, that out. Yeah, so that's good. We can, we can work through that on this episode. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about some of your work yeah. in a little bit, but okay. we, can, we can get into it because it's funny. We are very different in so many ways. Yes. Uh, you're very spiritual. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I'm very not. <laughs> we like have all these arguments and fights about, recently about like fact versus, versus feelings, feelings and, and that whole debate, which has been fun. And we have gotten nowhere. I don't know if we're going to get into it no. on this. Well, I was like, what are we going to talk about in like two seconds? We're probably going to be debating to politics. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, I was like before the show, I was like, don't. OK, don't say that. <laughs> don't say that. Because once we go down these rabbit holes, I know we get lost. We can't get like out of three it. Three hours later. Um, but anyway, so uh, your story to come coming to L.A., like, why did you first decide to come to LA? You've been here for about four or five years? Five and a half years. So weird. Um, oh, well, you're, you're involved in this story. So we were living together. Yeah. So um, in Philadelphia, uh, we had gotten a place together. You were right out of college. I was in a place where I was like, I was like, I'm going to live in this place for like five years. You know, when I have more money, Matt will move out. I'll end up living here for a while. And I think we were there for like three months, maybe two months, but I actually was traveling. I was on like a around the world ticket that JetBlue had done at the time where it was like $500. You could travel anywhere in the country as much as you wanted for 30 days. And I was like hopping around visiting friends. And I think I was in LA at the time, actually, my first time visiting, I think. And you called me and you're like, I want to move home. (sighs) And you're like, I'm broke. And I was like so pissed at you because I was like, no, I told, I think I had a talk right. with you before you moved in. Like, you're going to be able to pay your rent, right? And- no. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. It didn't quite work out like that because I remember you persuading me and because like back to then, move in together at this point, we're like, you were a few years into your graphic design business. Mm-hmm. I was uh, maybe a year, year and a half. Like I was in college, and but I was about a year and a half into my videography business and uh, I wasn't making a lot of money, but we would encourage each other at the time and like mentor each other through a lot of troubles that we had in terms of acquiring clients and the, the troubles that you go through and with a client-based business. I'm pretty sure that you uh, were encouraging me. Like, you can do it. Like, you can, do- come on, Matt. Yeah, yeah. Because I, just, I was just graduating from college mm-hmm. and I, I don't know if the notion of moving home with mom and dad was the forefront. It's certainly not something no. I wanted to do. I was like, let's give this a shot. And like, how do you run a business where like most of your clients were in Philly? Yeah. So, but the, the problem was I didn't have a car. Uh, I didn't, also, I wasn't making money. Oh my God, you didn't have a car. And rent was so like $700 a month and yeah. at this place yeah. each. I kind of remember that. Yeah. It was like 700 bucks a month each. Remember those days when yeah. rent was that cheap? <laughs> I was making uh, like seven to 700 to a thousand bucks a month. How do you remember this? Because you know how much money you were Because I remember at the time, like I remember that uh, project I did with the Philly cheesesteak teas. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. like that, like On weird sketch comedy thing. Yeah, and I got four hundred dollars for that video. Mm. Like that was my rate at the time. Like to shoot and edit a video was three to four hundred dollars, which is crazy because I was probably making ten dollars yeah. an hour. But so if I do, if I did like two to three projects a month, I would be able to pay rent and have like a little bit extra. T- to eat Mm -hmm. uh but after like it clearly didn't last long it was two months and then i called you up and said hey uh i knew you were gonna be pissed because we just moved in i was so pissed i held a grudge for a while too i was like i'm not moving anything Mm -hmm. and because it meant that i had to move home because i wasn't i didn't have a situation where i would be able to live with somebody else i didn't want to live with a stranger and it ended up being which i think i just thanked you for this the other day that Mm -hmm. like some of like the big um i think experiences in my life or big shifts and transformation some of them have come from like you sort of nudging or pushing me in that direction in that case it was a little bit selfish but it's okay you're welcome <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i don't think you can like you, I don't think you could, yeah i don't think you could thank me for that because at the time it was like uh it, it was really a low for you yeah i was traveling and i was just like i mean i didn't have a choice that's what you wanted to do and it wasn't just i think it was a good choice for you because you wanted you were just thinking about your future and wanting to pay off debt and go live at home and I just had a huge aversion to living at home with mom and dad Mm -hmm. or just not being independent. Um, And but then we did it and I was at home. I think I sulked for maybe a good week. And then I was like, all right, more than a week. Okay, I don't remember. (laughs) It was a couple months for a little bit. No, no, I wasn't even home that long. Yeah, I was only home for maybe two or three months. I don't remember. And then just was like, okay, I'm going to like use this to my advantage. I remember like buying some, I was a graphic designer at the time. So I like bought the whole Adobe creative suite, spent money on that, bought a new computer, um, you know, just kind of put myself in a better position and then decided, okay, I'm going to move somewhere. And I was like actually looking to move to like Mexico or something and just be adventurous, maybe Spain. 
And Crystal, who you know, mm-hmm. my close girlfriends, she was living in Hawaii and she just posted on Craigslist, oh, I have an open room. Not really to me or to anybody, I think more to people who are living on Maui. And I decided to go. I was like, this will be super fun. And I, it was like very spontaneous. And I think I probably, you know, talked to you about all of my big decisions before I make them. And I actually mm-hmm. remember talking to you and you were just like, can I swear on this? <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> Fuck it. Do it. You know? Yeah. Um, so I, I left two weeks later and went to Hawaii. Um, so that was like the start of the journey of like leaving the East coast and knowing that I wanted to live somewhere warm, Mm -hmm. ended up being there for like eight months was really good for the time that I was there, but knew it wasn't like a long-term thing. It was really far from you guys. And then went back to Jersey, was there for maybe another month or two, and then decided to come to L.A. Just m- mostly because of the weather. I really just wanted to be somewhere warm. And because I had a location independent business, it was like, why not try it? Oh, yeah. And you also had a friend, Colin, who was mm-hmm. living here. So it was it's, it's nice to have some rooting yeah. where you move to that can uh, help at least establish give you an idea of what it would be like to live there and they talk to somebody because like that's that's the hard thing is that when nat and i were looking for different places to live it's like we could kind of live almost anywhere Mm -hmm. and because we're you know as long as it's a major city she could find work and Mm -hmm. i could work from you know pretty much any any city i wanted to but uh it becomes pretty daunting to really understand what it's like. You have to live somewhere to understand if you're going to like it or not. Yeah. And that's why actually I was like, and I realized that when I moved to Maui, that was just like an experiment too. But after about three months there, I knew that I wasn't going to stay there long term. And so I realized, okay, I'm going to do that in LA. I'm just going to give it three months. And I told my friend Colin that I was moving in with, I think I said I would give it six months so that because I was on the lease, like I'll do six months. And I loved it. I did not think I was going to love LA. I thought Mm -hmm. I just thought it was going to be superficial, just all the stereotype stuff that I heard about Hollywood. And I just met some wonderful people. I've had such few bad experiences living here that I can't even really remember much of them. Um, And so, yeah, so I've just been hanging out here for the past five and a half years. Just just hanging out. Uh, That that, that's so funny, though, because moving to LA and just talking about LA with other people, everyone says, well, the people suck and the traffic's bad and like like the, the, the kind of cliche things that you hear. But honestly, in my experience so far, and, and both of us have a kind of freelance, we don't have the typical nine to five world like lifestyle. So uh, the traffic is usually not that bad because you can usually schedule around it. And the people thing, like if you can't find 10 people in a city of 10 million, that click with you and, and connect with your your, your values and, and, and what you want out of life, then it's probably probably you that's the problem. Yeah. I mean, I think that the stereotypes about living in different places, like you can really make it work almost anywhere you are, I feel like. Um, I think there's some places that are more ideal. Like I, one thing that I love about living here in terms of like going out to eat, being like a vegetarian is that I never have to worry about it. Whereas like, I forget that that's actually a thing. If I go to Philly and visit, it's like, oh, can I actually even eat anything on the menu? That's not a salad. A lot of times it's no. See, somebody asked me yesterday, like about the, the, do I like the culture in LA? Mm. Culture is such a hard thing to identify and to experience because it, like it's I'm not in the arts and theater and I don't know if that's what Anything people mean fun. when they say culture what do people that's not true um I play <laughs> I softball concerts. I play softball I love weather these are inside jokes um <laughs> I love weather yeah concert no that's my 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 grub with concerts is that they're not fun <laughs> maybe I'm just kind of awkward I just never know what to do with my hands uh and at the time when we went out to all these concerts when we were younger we weren't of drinking age so there was no way you for me to, to loosen be drunk up. To have fun. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. I mean, at a concert, like we went to Eminem, Fifty Cent, right? Yeah. That was the weirdest thing ever. We're on the lawn in the We're, way back, and what do you do at a concert like that? You sit on the, the yeah. You the, listen to the music. You listen to the music. Like, they're on stage smoking weed and like <laughs> pretending to shoot guns in the that, air. That was a bad concert because they were like super late. So you guys, Jack were Johnson, annoyed. very similar experience. That was a great concert. It was a good concert, but it's like it's like yeah, like you can you, you can't really hear them that well. I could listen what? to this stuff like You're on crazy. like my headphones. It would sound better. Okay, well, back to culture. I think that... So you don't want to go on this debate any longer? We're not going into 
to the, <laughs> okay. the concert debate because you're gonna lose because most normal people like listening to live music. Know. That's this is like the uh, Idiot Abroad. Do you know that show? Yeah. Oh my god, I forgot about that. Yeah. Is that still on? Uh, they've done a, quite a few seasons, but that's how I feel sometimes. Where like you go to Egypt and you see the pyramids and you're like, eh. It's all right. Like, it's not like, it's cool, but this is it. I think it's all about, like, your mentality going into something. Like, sometimes it's expectation of something being, like, this huge, like, whatever fun is to you. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think some things take a lot of effort, and maybe the payoff isn't that much worth it. Like, for example, going to a big concert like Jack Johnson, I think it it was a lot of effort at the time where we were living. You have to drive all the way to the location, which might have been 45 minutes to an hour drive, dealing with the parking, dealing with getting in, dealing with, like, $7 drinks or $7 water, and and then you're sitting really far back because you have really crappy seats, and then you're waiting forever for the performance. It feels like a lot. Yeah, Um, those are all bad things. They're all Yeah, they're all (laughs) things that, like, can make it not enjoyable. And then listen to music that you've already like overplayed. (laughs) Which is part of why like, I don't know, I was, there's some, you know, I was telling you about Echo Park Rising, which is like a really big um, event that they do in the neighborhood next to where I live every year and they support all local bands Mm -hmm. and I like don't know who anybody ever is and it makes me like feel a little bit disappointed in myself because I'm like that's awesome there's so many incredible Mm -hmm. artists in LA and this is where I live like I want to support them and I want to know you know I want to go out and listen to them and I went last year and like there were some really wonderful artists that's actually how I discovered So Far Sounds which isn't an artist but it's the experience of it's a company I guess that created this event where you um you can go they did it at this location but like you would basically go into people's living room so it like stands for sounds of our living room and you go in and you like listen to a local Wait, so band. far sound stands for sounds of our living yeah it's like not exactly precise but that's like I think what the oh I didn't know that. The, sort of an acronym you went to one with it. us in Brooklyn right Mm-mm. did you or no, no I think I told you guys about it when we no. were in Brooklyn but you guys went yeah I don't know yeah Natalie's the one that uh told me about it that dragged me out and she's dragged me out to a bunch of them but they're cool yeah like they're, they're you these... have to just listen to the music so, you're not allowed to talk right. you're not allowed to be on your phone yeah they have very strict rules because you know they i guess they the founders of so far sounds were just kind of sick and tired of going to these huge venues and these big music events where nobody was paying attention to the music and mm-hmm. it wasn't intimate and that's the thing i liked about some of the concerts that we went to the the more intimate smaller ones you feel a little bit closer to it and you feel you can vibe with the music more and that's what you get out of so far sounds which is which is pretty great it's like in living rooms it's less than 100 people in the audience uh, and it's usually bands that you've never heard of before i think that actually might be what it is for you you probably appreciate some of like the smaller venues here in la a friend of mine just went to i think it's called the troubadour which i I haven't been to i haven't done much live music here but it's a tiny little venue and he said it was really wonderful and just like super intimate and you just kind of feel the music and it's you know probably more of the experience that you'd be interested in yeah i told you this was just going to be a I random know we're like ra- way off topic do you remember where you where well you were originally we were talking about why did i move to la or what do i do <laughs> or why yeah. did it nah we got to why i do. moved to la um yeah why you got to la and you've been here for five and a half years it, you just fell in love with it right when you moved here or was it kind of some growing pains in the beginning well, I didn't have a car for the first year. It's so what? weird to think about that. Yeah. Well, I borrowed Colin's car. Oh, my so God. So my, my friend God and roommate. Bless him. <laughs> he, I'm like, how did he let me do that? I would never let me borrow my car never. for a year. I think he just didn't do a lot of things. He needed it for work sometimes. Sometimes he didn't. And um, I didn't use it very often. I think, like, I was dating someone at the time. So I would, like, drive to their place. But usually get mm-hmm. them to pick me up. Um, oh, you had a chauffeur. I that explains chauffeur. it. <laughs> yeah. No, but for not that, not for that long and and then just the grocery store so I wasn't doing a lot I just kind of was around my neighborhood walking to yoga and and whatever and then got to the point where I was like okay I need to like get if I'm gonna stay living here I need to get a vehicle I think that was it right you you were just coming out here temporarily so why buy a car right away especially when money is a little bit tight there was actually a footnote there that I wanted to bring up which is the the moving home like it allowed you to do a lot of stuff that you wouldn't have been able to otherwise. It wasn't obviously an intentional yeah. decision to move home, but you were able to buy the Adobe suite and, and kind of invest in, in yourself and your business in that way. Yeah. And I think actually that experience for me helped open me up to like, let life be what 
it's going to be like, don't try to control so much. Like I had this idea that I was going to be in Philly for five years and then I don't know, get in a relationship and live with this person in that particular place. And then I realized, oh my God, there's all these other things that I actually want for my life. Like I want to travel more. I had always wanted to like live in another country for a little bit, which I still haven't done. But at the time I was like, look, that's why I went to Hawaii. Cause I was looking actually at other places. And then I was like, let me just take some opportunities that are coming into me and be a little bit more, um, just open to what life has in store for me instead of planning it all out. You didn't have a choice to move here. I mean, you well, know, no. my perspective on that would be that like I was guided. So, right, this will get into our differences. <laughs> this oh, is the, be like obnoxious a, Matt comes out. This is, no, I was going to say this is like a cheesy radio show. Like, <laughs> like get some sound effects. No, I hope you cut that out. <laughs> yeah, I won't. I can't. I feel like we've done good. I don't need to cut anything out so okay. far. Um, um, so, yeah, yeah, the way that I feel is that I moved to LA and then about less, I think probably a year, maybe a little bit less than a year after moving here, I found breath work and ended up and was kind of, you know, in this journey of figuring out what is it I'm here to do because I knew it wasn't to be a graphic designer. And I knew that there was something else that was calling me and I didn't know what it was. And I was really suffering because of it and found breathwork and then had all of these series of events that led me to to breathwork and then to, you know, teaching breathwork because I didn't think that I was ever going to be a breathwork teacher. And, and that kind of led to Pushing Beauty becoming actually like a brand and a business, which I wasn't really expecting either. And that all sort of started to unfold. So a lot of it actually comes back to kind of moving at home, opening myself up to like whatever the journey was going to be for my life. And then actually moving to LA and moving LA, everything opened where I, you know, I would doubt that I would have kind of, um, been introduced to breath work anywhere else. Um, this is kind of a hub, a spiritual hub, I would say. There's a lot of openness, and that's a big part of, I think, the dialogue in Los Angeles. I mean, mm-hmm. if you listen to Overheard in LA, you'll hear a lot of like, quote unquote, woo woo, you know, spiritual talk. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so I would say for myself, I definitely think that looking back, there were all of these things that kind of lined up to create the life that I'm living now something shitty happens to you in life or something unexpected happens to you. Um, I don't see where it makes sense to just kind of uh, remain stuck in that misery Mm -hmm. because something happens to you like you have to move home with your parents. Mm -hmm. Uh, Someone breaks up with you suddenly. Somebody breaks up with you suddenly. You can sit and stew in that forever or you can choose in that moment to say, you know, this this thing was bound to happen. It, you know, clearly if a relationship ends, at least at that particular time, it meant that it was supposed to end. I could sit here and, and stew on it for the next like five years or I could push forward and move forward. I mean, this is like an interesting thing for you to talk about. You just wrote a book about uh, a breakup mm-hmm. that you had. And, and how did you approach that? Yeah, I think it's it's difficult for a lot of people to um, accept when things don't go the way that they think that they're going to go because I just think that's sort of the nature of the mind. We get on this path and we're like, okay, you know, I'm going to do this or this is happening in my life. You know, I've moved. It's going to work out. I started this business. It's going to work out. I'm in a relationship. You know, we're moving forward. And your mind starts to create this whole future that doesn't even exist. Um, The person that I was dating at the time, we were talking about moving in together. And so when you're like speaking about moving in together, it feels very solid. You know, it feels like your mind starts to create this vision and you're talking about it and it's, it's actually bringing it to life. So, a big part of the ending of that relationship was also mourning the future that was never going to exist. Of course, a huge part of it was actually mourning the loss of that relationship, not being, you know, him not being a part of my life anymore. But another element of it is actually mourning, you know, the future that no longer is going to exist. So for me, there, there are other situations that I would have that I do manage very well, you know, and I think over time becoming more and more open to life um, kind of guiding me um, and also like with my own personal development, spiritual development, I trust much more that I am always supported. And so when things happen that are sort of unexpected for me and, and this breakup was a big part of me like learning to really trust deeply that 
Um, there's more for myself. Like, I don't think that that relationship actually was uh, the relationship for me. And I don't think that I would have left it, maybe not for a very long time, um, like maybe eventually, but mm-hmm. it, it wasn't actually one in which I could have truly been myself and and explored more and become more of who I was. So it, it feels almost like, um, I'll just speak in the terms, the language that I'll use is that like the universe <laughs> Were is, you gonna, like, <laughs> I'm just like, how am I going to say this right now? <laughs> not dumb it down, but I guess. Like the way that I think about it is like the universe kind of like cleared this out because I wasn't willing to do it and it wasn't my path. And and I needed to kind of let go of that to um, to become more of who I am. And that's really what my book is about. It's like the whole journey of accepting, OK, this happened. It really sucks. It's really painful. How am I going to use this to learn about myself, to heal, to better my life? Because I'm not going to sit here in misery for the rest of my life and let this ruin me. Breathwork was one of those things for you that you discovered. This is something that's radically transformed your life. I would not be who I am right now if it wasn't for breathwork. I, you know, it's funny because mom. Wait, can we step back real yeah, quick? Explain. What the hell is breathwork? Yeah. <laughs> Because this is a new thing. Like you, you drive around LA here and you see billboards that say breathwork on it. Breathwork what? classes. You do? Yeah, it's actually the place that you do it at the. One down dog. Where we saw that med- the laughing meditation guy. Oh, hyper slow. Hyper slow. They have a billboard on top of it that says breath work, fifty dollars a class or something. Really? Is that you? Is that your classes? No, I've never uh, taught else? there. Yeah. Oh yeah. So mm. they have they have but anyway, you come to LA and you see these billboards like breath work and, and you hear a lot of people talking about it and, and I see it more and more online, but I think outside of LA is yeah. probably very rare. Yeah. I mean it's it's even here it's grown tremendously. When I first started, um, practicing myself I couldn't find I couldn't find it I mean I was like googling it trying to find people and actually um at the time I was like kind of I don't know why maybe it was like a little bit embarrassed sort of like a a closet meditator a little bit and I remember not um because I think I didn't know what this thing was right so my first experience of breath work was I went into somebody's space. I laid down on like a massage table and he told me how to breathe. I closed my eyes. Music was playing. And like, I remember it being pretty powerful. I don't think I cried or anything, which is pretty common for a lot of people's first um, sessions. Um, I did it a couple times and I, and I remember feeling really like light and vi- and. Also, I'll say like I had major like control issues, trust issues, like very kind of deeply wound or tightly wound where it wasn't easy for me to let go. So it started to gradually open me up a little bit more and a little bit more and then went through a breakup with somebody else um, and was like, hadn't done breath work in a while. And I was like, I think I need to get back to that thing that I was doing that was really powerful. And I told a girlfriend of mine and I remember like feeling like, I don't know if I can tell her this because I don't know if she'd be open to it. And she was like, oh my God, I went to a breath work class like the other day and she gave me the person's information. I started going to those workshops. Now almost every yoga studio in LA is teaching breath work. Like you can, Mm -hmm. you can find it very easily. Okay, so why don't you walk me through like a three minute breath work? Like this is what normally a forty five minute thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you walk me through uh, a breath work? Yeah, what meditation. Do you do? I'm gonna get us a, a music going. Oh, first. okay. You can go on my. Are you have Spotify open? I have playlists. Gonna, oh, okay. Yeah, let's do that. Let's okay. do that. Um, Spotify. Yeah. All right, we found it. And which? What you want to the start? first one? Is that slow motion for me? Slow motion. All right, so just let's do three minutes. I know you. What What are you taking your glasses off for? So I can breathe. Oh, you gotta lay down. <clears throat> well, I know I'm not gonna lie down, right, but let's. You'll just, be fine. This is like normally I would lie down. Yeah. Okay. Is that too loud? Is that good? No, that's great. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So yeah, if you are listening to this or watching this and you want to have a little taste, so you just lay down somewhere, anywhere that's comfortable, and close your eyes. And you're going to breathe in and out of your mouth. (laughs) That's smirking. So you're going to breathe in and out of your mouth. So let your jaw be nice and loose. And you're going to breathe once into your belly, once into your heart, and then you're going to exhale. (sighs) 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 (sighs)
You might feel a little bit lightheaded and that's fine, it's normal. And you're just gonna keep on breathing into your belly, into your heart and exhale. And your pace doesn't really matter. You're gonna just let it be a circular breath. So you're not gonna pause at the top or the bottom. And as you're breathing like this, with your eyes closed, you can just start to let your body relax. And you can just imagine everything opening up. Imagine your heart opening. Make sure your legs are uncrossed. You can have your arms by your side, palms facing up. And just give yourself permission to let go of your mind and start to connect to your body. If you're feeling any type of anxiousness coming up, if you're feeling really lightheaded, you can just say out loud, it's safe for me to breathe and just keep on breathing. All right. Wow. You feel lightheaded? I do. I feel really lightheaded. Yes. Oh my God. So that was only like... That was like two, two and a half minutes. Yeah. I feel transformed. <laughs> so, I feel very lightheaded right now. Yeah. So and you, that was only two and a half minutes. Yeah. So you, and usually the lightheadedness is like the mind is, is resisting letting go. So the more you work with the breath, you wouldn't feel so much of that sensation uh, actually. It's kind of like when you drink alcohol enough, you kind of get desensitized to it. It's totally exactly it's like totally that. It's totally different. <laughs> it's totally different. So uh, if you wanted to, to do that, you would a minimum around seven minutes so you would lay down and breathe for about seven minutes that's when the mind starts to let go and you actually begin to feel sort of tingly sensations in your body and your fingertips i and felt that i did, did yeah i did feel that already i didn't eat much so mm -hmm. i don't know if that plays into it at all depends depends on the person your mental and how, state yeah and, and you're drinking coffee too so <laughs> <laughs> i totally did this wrong didn't i um that's all right but that that was um normal so you do these sometimes 40 minutes yeah, they're they're typically you'd typically typically be breathing for about thirty to thirty five minutes and then resting for about fifteen minutes, ten to fifteen minutes. So, uh, I, I I meditate a bit and I know a lot about meditation and the idea of meditation is that there is not supposed to be a purpose. You're not supposed to be trying to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to be trying to become enlightened because mm -hmm. if you try, then that defeats the purpose. You're supposed to just observe the thoughts and then let them go. Uh, breath work seems to be. Uh, Related in some ways, but entirely different in a lot because, yeah. Yeah, no, it's really interesting, actually. I haven't talked too much about this, but um, coming from, you know, I, I kind of studied more um, traditional sort of Eastern um, philosophy around meditation and enlightenment. And uh, with breath work, there's not so much of a conversation around enlightenment or maybe the intention behind breath work is a little bit different, even though it is actually like an ancient practice. Um so yeah, I mean, it's, it's very energetic. It's about healing and releasing pain, um, stored emotions, limiting beliefs from your body, from your energy system. So it has very different results. Um, I would say for most people than, um, a, like a sitting meditation does a lot of people I know myself included have really struggled with sitting meditation because our minds are so active. And I think also probably because of the ways in which we're kind of addicted to technology and being on our phones all the time, I think our minds are even more wired to go, 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 that it becomes very challenging to sit for even five minutes, just to sit still for five minutes. So breath work is actually really powerful in that you're you're doing something. So it's an active meditation. You're focusing on your breath, but you're not just observing your breath like you would in maybe a sitting meditation where the object of your attention is the breath. You're actually using your breath to open yourself up. Just to so people who have no idea what breath work is, like Sounds interesting, but where does it go from those initial couple minutes? Yeah, like in my private session, so usually I'll talk to the person for 
15 to 30 minutes, depending about like what's going on in their life, where they're feeling stuck. So this relates to what we were speaking about before, where you're like, I'm not going to let something keep me stuck. There's a lot of things in our lives that actually do keep us very stuck. And and most people are going to have some area in their life that they're feeling stuck. So we'll kind of talk about that. I'll get clear on what's going on in their lives. Usually pretty much everybody has something from childhood that has wounded them in some way. Um, We tend to think about things like, you know, oh, I look back at my childhood and, you know, I was teased or like this horrible thing happened to me and like I'm kind of over it. Um, If it wasn't like a big trauma like sexual abuse or physical abuse, we kind of, you know, we'll be like, well, I was a kid and like I get that and that sucked, but, you know, that doesn't affect me anymore. And actually it does. Um, So like I get kind of clear about those things. I'll have them lay down. Yes, I usually burn some sage. I'll I'll kind of, you know, clear the energy in the space, um, have them start breathing. I'll put some music on. And then um, I usually, you know, I have to kind of watch the body and see what's happening in the body as you're breathing. Um, The body will start to respond in certain ways that actually can kind of give you some signals as to what's going on emotionally um, and spiritually with the person. And it totally depends. It's different in every session, but sometimes I'll have them say something something, you know, um, yeah, gratitude will kind of come into play usually further towards the end, but usually some of the pain that's been stored. So, you know, you could just say, for example, um, you know, being, we'll just say heartbreak because that's, you know, what my book is about. So you go through a breakup and like you feel betrayed by this relationship ending or by this person that is stored, you know, in the emotional body, in the physical body as well. And, So I'll have like, I'll basically maybe say something like they'll say the person's name. I release your pain from my body. And usually they'll release a lot of emotion, a lot of sadness. Sometimes I'll have people yell, which can be really, um, therapeutic because we don't really get to do it very often. And also it's, it helps to release some of the stuck energy in the body. Um, and a lot of times people will be like sobbing and, and have some realizations about how much actually like these incidences have actually affected their lives and more importantly, their sense of self. So it all really comes back to self-love. Like these different things happen into our, happen in our lives that, um, make us make us believe that we're not worthy of love and it doesn't matter how much you're you seem to be a confident person in your life no matter how like independent you are no matter you know how successful you are on some level there can be something that makes you believe I'm not totally worthy of x y or z a lot of times people can be super successful in their career and you know not feel worthy of having a, a, a wonderful partnership um, and so those things actually can become healed in a breathwork session, usually several sessions when you're working through healing something in particular. So yeah, people will release a lot of emotion. And then once the emotions release, typically the heart can start to open. And that's when people will start to feel like deep sense of gratitude for their life, for the people in their life, their life for, um, you know, themselves, for all of the work that they've done. A lot of times people will get like, you know, insights into, you know, how lovable they actually are or how worthy they actually are. Creative insights will come in and inspiration. So it, it's a full range, um, but really powerful transformative work. I know you know how much I always talk about it changing my life, and I'm sure you've seen me change over the years. But also, you know, the people that I've worked with, I see them transforming very quickly after only a few sessions. And then people in their lives will be like, you know, I have clients come in after a couple sessions saying like, my coworker is saying something totally different about me, or like my mom or my boyfriend are saying like how, you know, much more open and um, just happier I feel. So some people might be listening to this thinking, uh, being skeptical mm-hmm. of breath work, as I have been for my whole, <laughs> for my whole, I mean, I, I can see the difference that it's made in you, though yeah. I say like, well, it's probably like, I don't need it in mm-hmm. my life. Somebody who's skeptical of this. Some people might say like I did, uh, or questioned you with like, isn't that, isn't it just like, um hyperventilating aren't you Mm -hmm. just like draining yourself of air because people do get a little bit high tingly and have these sensations um how would you address that I'm like not too concerned with like skeptics like honestly like my the work that I do it's like if you're open to it and this feels like it resonates with you cool come do a session try working with it um 
I feel like you have to be you have to be open enough on your journey to try something to be open enough to trying something usually when people I've actually had some clients who were like gifted a session and they'll come in and be like um you know I have no idea what this is but my friend recommended it or whatever and then they're like absolutely blown away by it um I will say from my my own first experience breathing, I don't remember being incredibly blown away by it like I was a little bit later. And I think a lot of it is because I was so um, guarded and I was so closed off and I wasn't very trusting even of the person that I was working with. So yeah, I I think that a lot of it has to do with like your level of openness. Um, In terms of like the hyperventilation, I like when I first started teaching, I was like so afraid of like getting it wrong or like not like I've I've always felt this way. I was just what? I was just like, like like you're saying like getting it wrong like if you accidentally told somebody to hold their breath and then you forgot to tell them to keep breathing yeah, and, and they, like, then they, they died. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that would happen. That but would like, but I was happen. just thinking like it, it, it seems completely safe and it yeah. like. It, nobody's died from doing breath work right. and hyperventilation uh, itself. I don't know much about it, but it sounds like it could be dangerous, but it doesn't sound like that's what you're getting. No, I mean, the research that I would get a lot of questions like that in the beginning. And what's interesting, too, is I definitely think there's something to what you're afraid of will start to come in. So like when I was really afraid of like, you know, maybe not knowing everything that I needed to know or not understanding all the science, I would get a lot of questions from people that were skeptical or were not sure that it was safe. Um, around like, are we hyperventilating? So I was like doing a lot of research on hyperventilation. <laughs> right. And from what I read, hyperventilation is like, I guess when the exhale is like longer than the inhales are. And like you, if you're like pushing out your exhale. So what we're doing is like a much more controlled breath that um, is that, a gentle exhale. Right. Because hyperventilation happens when you are, say, having a panic attack. Mm-hmm. You literally can't catch your breath. But if you're in the middle of a breathwork sec- session, you say at some point after 30 minutes, you stop breathing. I mean, and, and sure, people probably would start a little bit slower too. Like you said, you might even do seven minutes, 10 minutes to start. Um, after that 10 minutes, do you feel like <gasps> like out of breath? Or No, yeah, yeah. not at all. Yeah. So as soon as you're done, bre- you're basically just activating your energy. So like you're starting to feel your energy moving and that actually takes the forefront. Like the breath eventually... It's almost as if the breath is like breathing you. The breath becomes something that starts to move on its own and you're not even paying so much attention to it. It's sort of just happening. Um, I think that the the fears that come up around it are so much about where the person's at in their life and how what and actually what their relationship to life is so if like you're terrified of breathing you're terrified of a lot of other things you're afraid to let go you're you have trust issues you're probably a pretty controlling person you might have you might suffer from anxiety so usually that is like a an indication that there's some deeper stuff going on and breathwork will actually really help you usually i have everybody start breathing by saying um, it's safe for me to breathe. And I think I said that in the little two minute and that Mm -hmm. helps to affirm that like, it is completely safe to breathe. Um, I've had people who've had different, you know, illnesses or different things going on. It's really all about, um, their comfortability in it. And and this is what I always say. Like, if you feel comfortable breathing, it's going to be fine. It's all about, if you're terrified of it, you might start feeling like you're having a panic attack or something like that. Um, but usually when somebody lays down and especially when I'm guiding them, they feel safe enough to start to let go. Here's my problem. Uh, with life in general, <laughs> and you could be my therapist. Got a lot of them. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, I'd struggle between the balance of skepticism and open mindedness, mm-hmm. and it's a constant push pull for me. And there are times when I can let myself be open to try something new and to explore something that's um, a bit uncharted, like breath work that you know, it's so new. There, There's no science on it. Meditation, there's science out there. There's ways that I could justify. Uh, and there's like a lot of people like Sam Harris and others that, that uh, Dan Harris that write about meditation and the positive effects it's had on their life. And I said, okay, I could try that. Um, like Dan Harris's book, 10% Happier was definitely one of those books for me. The Power of Now was the book I read in college. I think you had lent it to me. I read and I say, okay, yeah, like this stuff really clicks for me. I can start to, let me try to bring this into my life and let me see. Um, it seemed like there was a deeper truth there that I was able to connect with. Uh, but then 
I'm also, as an atheist, extremely skeptical of everything that's not fact-based, science-based. Mm-hmm. How do you... Like, you don't really have a problem with that because you're so open-minded about everything. Do you draw a line anywhere? Do you have that same push-pull at all? Because you have to be skeptical of some stuff, right? There's some shit that you listen to and you're like, all right, that's like... Yeah. Like, you should, like, bathe your baby in milk. Like, <laughs> I just made that up. But, like, say if you heard that from somewhere, you might say... That sounds crazy. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to do that. But then you read an article on it on Medium and you're like, okay, maybe I'll... Wash- Everybody's doing it. It's like the new... I mean, there are fads like that, right? Where everyone's yeah. doing it, like lemon water and stuff. Um, as you were just speaking, what came up for me, and we haven't talked about this, but that skepticism is actually um, a lack of trusting yourself. So I sort of feel like the more you trust yourself and develop a deeper relationship to who you are and like your orientation to life. So for me, like I, I'm very spiritual. So I feel like a connection to what I call the universe, um, spirit, God, whatever you want to call it. I know you wouldn't call it any of those things, but whatever it is for you, I have this, this, um, deep trust in life and in, um, in, in myself and that I'm going to know when something doesn't resonate with me. And so if it's not resonating, I guess that's what I would maybe say. Like I might be skeptical of something. I don't tend to ever describe myself as a skeptic and I don't, I don't even know really what the true definition would be, but I don't think that I really am at all. I just feel like if it resonates with me, I move towards it. If it doesn't, then I just kind of let it go. But you said, uh, skepticism is not, believing in yourself or not trusting Trusting. yourself but coming from somebody who was raised catholic mom's totally gonna listen to this but somebody who was raised (laughs) she said on the way over she she, said listen to that one (laughs) hi mom (laughs) hi mom Uh, being somebody that was raised religious and then moving away from religion and becoming an atheist i feel like i was tricked Mm -hmm. by an idea by people who believed in something Mm -hmm. um that i believe to be untrue now uh so it's less of trust in myself, but trust in other people. It's like, hey, you guys lied. <laughs> that- yeah, that's actually, su- I think that's like totally valid. And I had that. I mean, I was like kind of in a cult and, you know, Yeah, I'm felt- glad you brought that up. I actually did bring it up in the last podcast with Jesse. Oh, did you? Yeah, because we were talking about postmodernism uh-huh. uh, and how you guys kept saying, like, oh my, like it, you, it was a whole crusade against postmodernism. postmodernism. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Wait, let's talk about the cult because that's, yeah. that's, that's, this actually really great parallel to what I was just talking about. Yeah. So I got in, so I was, it's okay. So raised Catholic felt like does not make sense. Does not make sense. I actually remember when the bubble burst of like, um, man in the sky, God for me. And it actually was post college. Mm. So, but I will say that I always felt like there, I had a lot of questions about Catholicism and religion that, weren't ever really satisfied. So there are all of these kind of holes there. And I always felt like there was going to be some other religion that I would find that would resonate with me. Like in college, I took, I think, an intro to world religion or something like that. And I learned about all different religions. And I always assumed like Buddhism would would resonate with me. And at the time, it didn't. Um, And so, yeah, I think that I, I just always felt like there was something more. And like, I just kind of took what I had and felt like, um, I don't know if I would say brainwashed, but like, I just felt like I was living in a bubble and then like, you know, going away to school and starting to kind of study different things and, and kind of expand my perspective led me to, um, to an organization that was led by a guy in his fifties who, um, white guy in his fifties from New York who had went to India and had an awakening basically, you know, became enlightened, um, and started this organization. And, um, he was really fusing Eastern, um, spirituality with, science with evolution and so that really resonated with me because I was also very rational and into you know like very fact-based science-based things so for me looking back on my journey it was the the um the opening for me to become actually as spiritually open as I am now because like 
I never ever in a million years would have been like into like crystals and burning sage or anything like that because I think I was I don't even know why but I was just not open-minded to that at all and so like I really needed like a bridge so something that was um, a little bit more rational or a lot more rational that could kind of help me get into spirituality and that's what that was for me turns out (laughs) um it it just it, it was an organization and so they had you know and I don't think there's anything wrong with money I think there's a lot of actually unhealthy relationship um or a perspective around money and spirituality that like we shouldn't be charging for like spiritual teachings and stuff which I think is all nonsense um so but there was um, a big emphasis on commitment and so once you're a part of something you know group think is super real and I'm still like because of the experiences I had I'm super conscious of that because you know I am part of you know a community a lot of um you know friends of mine are part of the breathwork community and I had a huge aversion to like even saying that I was like part of a community even though it's such a loose thing right it's like wherever I'm at I feel like I'm a part of whatever that community is or I would like to believe that at least um but because of the way that group think it's so dangerous you know so what ended up happening in this organization was that so many people were actually unhappy I was deeply deeply unhappy and I was involved for probably four to five years um and not even as in depth as some people were like there were some people who were like living in an ashram and Um, their experiences were much different than mine, you know, our good friend, my good friend, and you know, you know, Fred as well was living there for 10 years and it really fucked up his, his life. You know, he, I won't speak for him, but like, you know, he, he's suffered from a lot of, um, just own personal things from being a part of this isolated community. I was on the outskirts and, you know, was involved in going on retreats and, um, doing workshops and doing like trainings or whatever their programs were but because commitment was so emphasized I felt judged all the time I felt like um, everybody was always watching me to see if I was doing something or involved in something and so you know things were quite pricey and there was like a lot of conversation around like your your level of commitment and it, it actually to me felt like very militant like what, feels what you- a lot like Scientology yeah, I mean, watching Going Clear was <laughs> Liz, my friend Liz and I, were, we were both part of the organization and uh, we watched it with her husband, who was also a part of it, and got in a huge debate after watching Going Clear because of the parallels between mm-hmm. that and w- what we were involved in. Well, that, the, the funny thing is, how do you define cult versus religion? Mm. Just a cult is just a smaller religion. A cult is just not mainstream yet. And I don't even know. I mean, it's been so long that I've really even been talking about this and and delving into the concept of a cult. But I think there's probably some clearer definitions around what that really means. Let's look it up. We got Wikipedia right here. Go ahead, do it. Um, It's one of the great things about the internet. Cult, a system of religious veneration and devotion directed towards a, a particular figure or object. Uh, There's more here. A relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister. I don't think those are very good definitions. Uh, A misplaced or excessive admiration for a particular person or thing. I think they're really good. Mm -hmm. I think this one's really good. A relatively small group of people. So, I mean, cults are never very big. There's never like millions of people. You say, oh, that they're in a cult. You wouldn't generally define it as that. Um, But anyway, relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices. And I think this is the big thing regarded by others as strange or sinister. But that's what I don't like about it, actually. Like that. Because it's like, well, just because other people think it's strange, why does that make it a cult? The way that I think about a cult is like you're, you're brainwashed. Like you, you just because other people think it's weird, because I would say people think breath works weird. But it's the combination I, I think, think cause, cult- like, it's religious belief or practices. I mean, everything, I guess, because you could say everything is regarded as strange or sin- sinister is a big word. Right. Because cult has a connotation to it mm-hmm. that you're, like you said, brainwashed into uh, following somebody without regard for your own values and beliefs. Well, and I, what I would say would define maybe in hindsight would be that you're a part of something that actually isn't serving you. And I think that that's actually what happened where everyone started to actually call it a cult was that, oh, everybody in this community was saying, I lost my autonomy. 
So when you're losing your autonomy, that I think that would be a great definition of a cult. Like when you have no autonomy, you're basically making decisions based off of what you know, a leader or a group of people say that you should do in this particular organization. Like, um, I actually remember people saying to me, uh, about relationships. Like I actually believed at the time that I could never be in a relationship with somebody who wasn't a part of this organization. And there were not many young dudes <laughs> that were a part of it. And so like, I, I started to contemplate, okay, am I like just going to be single forever? And which actually was kind of an interesting thing to start to contemplate. But it, it, I eventually got to the point where I realized like I am miserable. And for me personally, it was about like, we would have like these intellectual conversations. So it was like very intellectually driven and I felt like I couldn't be myself because I needed to be because I felt very judged and and I was judged I mean people were kind of watching you they had like tears and so like people who were at like the certain tier were kind of looking at you and listening to you to see where you were and like where to kind of group you when you would like get together and have these conversations Um, and so I remember just being like, oh, I'm actually fucking miserable. And like, I don't even like, like my life. I don't even like going to these things. Like, why am I doing this? And I don't remember like what we, I think we were talking about skepticism. Mm -hmm. So bringing it back to that and like the lack of trust, like when you're, cause I think you were talking about, um, being like part of why you feel skeptical is because you were born into a religion essentially and then you were like oh I was duped it's yeah that, that's a big part of it and then also uh coming out of that and then learning and and you know you have mentors through the form of books and through documentaries mm-hmm. and stuff that that help to push skepticism um as a positive value so what I will say is that to to support my theory that skepticism is about not trusting yourself, the more you actually get to know, like I got involved in that like quote unquote cult because I didn't actually know myself very well and I definitely didn't love myself. And so I was looking for something outside myself to give life meaning and to make, make the world make sense to me. Like I felt very frustrated and confused about the world and the suffering and the pain that people were in. And so being a part of this, you know, organization that was like talking about spiral dynamics and like the theory of the theory of human development, understanding why people are the way that they are and understanding like, you know, different levels of human consciousness, it inspired me and excited me. And I think there were a lot of things within it that were really valuable and interesting to be experimenting with and and just learning about. Um, But my sense of self was being um, defined or being validated by this group and organization instead of me, me feeling reliant on myself. So the more that I've developed a relationship with myself and learned like to give myself validation, which essentially is another way of saying like learning to love myself and be okay with who I am, no matter what I'm involved in. And this is why I actually wrote an article not that long ago about like, um, stop trying to find your, I forgot how I phrased it. It was like, stop trying to, not your people, your, your tribe. Everyone's talking about like your tribe. And I'm like, stop trying to find your tribe because it's actually about trying to find yourself whenever we're trying to find like this group that we fit in with, or like this, you know, um, tribe of people who are like your people. It, it actually, I feel like does a disservice to us because one, you're trying to fill something typically, um, outside of yourself, but two, it also kind of like creates these compartments that don't allow other people in. So it's like, I'm in with this group and then that act, that automatically makes other people like the others. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, in, in terms of the skepticism and open-mindedness, I, I kind of positioned it originally as a either or when I, now that we're talking about it and I'm thinking about it more because this is the first time I've, I, it's something that's been internally going on but I haven't really talked about. But I don't think it needs to be either or. I think it can be and. I think you can be, open-minded and skeptical or maybe put it first you're skeptical but Mm open-minded because in a lot of ways you are uh, very open-minded about ideas that are tend to be uh, like eastern medicine practice like certain stuff Um, but you are very skeptical of 
conservative ideas and like mm-hmm. in terms of religious lean or not religious leanings, uh, but in terms of political leanings, you you definitely sway liberal and you're very skeptical of these other ideas. So in, in that regard, you, you do have skepticism and you do have a bit of both and, and maybe you would use a different word for, than skepticism, yeah. but, um, that's, that's how I feel as well. I think you always have to be a little bit skeptical of new ideas, but always open to the fact that you somebody could change your mind if new facts become apparent to you or if you experience something that changes your mind uh you should be open to that and allow yourself to change and not hold on so tightly to these ideas that you've had just because of the experience you had before that yeah what came up for me when you were saying that is just especially in terms of like politics what i'm leaning into more now is like I want to be like a better listener and I want to um, be able to hold, like just hear more and understand more. So like definitely in my past, I would come to things like, I I just like felt like I needed to know and I needed to come into things with a fixed position. Like this is what my position Mm -hmm. is. This is, and like, you know, you know, growing up, I was like, I would debate all the time and like, I'm not really interested in that as much anymore. It's funny to think about like, if you were to debate a younger version of yourself when you you (laughs) thought you knew everything and then you'd be like, dude, child, shut up. I'd be so frustrated with myself, I think. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Do you have to be informed? I don't know. Well, this is like an interesting thing because this is I've been listening to um never before with Janet Mock it's like a new I don't know if it's a newer podcast but I just found out about it Lena Dunham is the I think executive producer and I don't know she's like I'm totally feeling her and like she um interviewed Maxine Waters on it and I didn't I didn't even know who she was and I was listening to this yesterday and I was just like you know listening to podcasts I think are a really great way and like but I watch Vice News and it can be hard I think to read a lot of things now like I can put on podcasts and stuff when I'm um, cooking or whatever but I've been feeling like I need to be more and more educated. The more I am aware and understanding and hearing different people's perspectives, like, you know, especially around, um, like the kind of, uh, pronoun use for, uh, different people in like the trans community. Um, I think we were talking about that the other day. It's very confusing at first. And like the more that I'm listening to things, I was just listening to auction on, um, never before. I can't remember what this girl's name is. She's like a 15 year old girl who's on, um, uh, Girl Meets World, which is like a spinoff of Boy Meets World. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like a Disney show, but she is so woke. She's like a you did huge not just use activist. Woke. You just, Michelle, you're yeah. 30. You're over 30. Yeah. You can't use woke. Of course I can. <laughs> so like, so she's basically really um, uh, educated about like just feminism and um, what's going on in the world, you know, especially a lot of issues around like, you know, she's using the term queer and she, and I was, and I'm like recognizing that there's so much that I've kind of stepped out of and don't know about. And I'm just trying to be really curious and really listen and hear and um, understand more. And I think it's really, really important because it, it feels like things are changing really quickly. And so to be, I want to be somebody in the world who is, um, who is open and loving and accepting. And that means that I have to listen more and I need to understand more and be willing to um, hear what different people's perspectives are. And really it's about the ways in which they experience life. Um, because it can it can be very easy to um, to see everything through your own lens, through the ways that you are raised, the experiences that you have, and make the assumption that everybody else's experience is somewhat similar. You know, maybe we don't assume that it's exactly the same, but we think it's in this certain certain realm. Um, and and actually, people have dramatically different experiences in life that shape the ways in which you know they view different issues politically and stuff. And I think that we need to really start to listen to that continuing to grow and to learn mm-hmm. uh, it's something that I've just kind of reignited in myself in terms of listening to podcast like I'll do the podcast two times speed it's like the matrix like brrr, like you just do? like da- downloading into my brain it depends like if it's something that's like really um, like heady and mm-hmm. and really 
complicated mm -hmm. of a subject, like the uh, something about the universe and black holes and stuff. You do slow mo. I'll go one point five. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Point five <laughs> speed. I'm slowing it down. But for the most part, if I can keep up with the conversation, like listen to Joe Rogan podcast, I can go that two times speed. Um, and because how we, do you even do that? Uh, on the podcast app, you can do it. You can. Yeah, yeah. You can. That's cool. It's pretty easy to do. Look, I'll show you. Um, click on the podcast. Which one? I was listening to the dark side, Sam Harris. But right there. Oh shit! Two times. That's awesome. And the half. That's weird. The half is weird. But it's uh It's I can't do it when I'm driving for the most part. Not around LA. Mm -hmm. It just gets kind of crazy. You have to pay attention to the road, and yeah. I, I can't do two times the speed. And like for so so, but for certain things, it's just really uh, rewarding, and mm -hmm. I feel very stimulated. Mm -hmm. And I think it it kind of steps up my game a little bit because. We get so. It's the older we get, we we, we tend to get complacent, mm -hmm. and you don't. Most people don't read. Period. Um, I try to read. If you don't have time to read, that's why I do the podcast or the audiobooks. Yeah. And I think just the continuous pursuit of knowledge and um, moving away from ignorance is is really important. Yeah, I actually I always butcher this guy, guy's last name. I forget it, but Neil. Parisha or something like that. I forget his last name, but I'm on one of his lists. I should probably know actually how to say his last name being that I'm on his mailing list, but he does like a monthly um, book list. He reads a shit ton of books a month. And I read one of these articles he wrote somewhere about Stephen King inspiring him. And I just read um, on, on writing yeah. by Stephen King and Stephen King reads like 80 books a year or something. He's like, I read pretty slow about 80 books a year. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Here's the thing though. You, do what you enjoy too. Yeah, he obviously enjoys reading. Mm -hmm. um, if and if you start a book and you don't like it and it's like drudgery, right? Like, don't you don't Put have to it keep down. reading it? Yeah, I know. I, that was a big lesson I learned. I started reading Goldfinch last two years ago, I think, and it's like. A, I don't know if you've seen that book, but it's like a chunker. It's like this mm -hmm. big, I found 800 pages or something. And I got like halfway through and I hated that book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and my, I was with my ex at the time and he was like, just stop reading it. And I yeah. was like, really? Like there's this feeling of like needing to finish a book, but it's like life is too short. There's only so many books that we can read, put it down. Yeah. And there's so many other books out there that you might actually enjoy. Yeah. And so anyways, what he was saying, um, on one of his things was like he reads so much now and I think he does the same thing like if he's not feeling it like a little bit in he'll like he'll put it down and pick up something else but he's like my life is so rich now like he feel he's like I feel so so much like smarter and so much more like just a vast of things to, to talk about and I feel the same way like now that I've started to listen I go through phases of like listening to tons of podcasts and then I take breaks or reading a ton and taking a break I tend to read a lot, but, um, but then I like, I feel like I have like all of this like interesting stuff to talk about and it, it just kind of, yeah, I think it is just about like expanding your, um, your interests and in and in your depth of knowledge and the ways in which, um, you think about things. And also I, I love memoirs too. And that's mm -hmm. a big part of, I think, understanding like different people's perspective. I've always loved memoirs. I think you read about things that resonate. I'm actually a really big fan. I have a new series on my podcast called, um, it was called currently reading. Now it's called, I don't remember. We'll be reading. We'll be reading. No, it's what's your podcast? The pushing beauty podcast, pushing beauty podcast on iTunes. Yep. So I cut you off though. You were talking, you talk about books that you, you. Oh, so yeah, I have a series that's about like what I'm reading and I was just talking about how, um, or like what I've just read. So I was just talking about how like I tend to read books that show up for me like over and over again. Like I'll just keep seeing them or they'll be referred to me by somebody or there'll be these weird synchronicities. And then I feel like, okay, I need to read that book and I'll pick it up. So that was one of them. Yeah. I think when it's somebody that you respect and trust too, like mm -hmm. it depends where the source is coming from. If like somebody says like this is a book that you really need to read, this book changed my life. Like, All right, I'll read it. But sometimes it, it may hit you at the wrong time. Like say book about spirituality. I was talking about it um, in a, in a podcast with Jordan uh, Lejuin, who was the founder of Futurism mm -hmm. or the founder of Futurism, and he was talking about how the book Zen and the Art of Happiness was this kind of amazing transformative book so i picked it up and i i started reading it because i was like oh that's cool because like you know if it had that profound of effect on him then like i'm like oh maybe it'll affect me but i kind of got that same stuff through the power of now i had already read it yeah i'd already you know had those experiences of learning and feeling an idea and uh for the first time so it depends i think when i was listening you. to tim ferris's podcast i think he was talking to um derek sivers but it might have been somebody else 
And um, they were talking about the same thing. They were debating like a book, uh, one particular book. And like this one book had a huge impact on Tim Ferriss. And then I think Derek Sivers was like, eh, I wasn't yeah. really feeling it. And like they were sort of talking about this that – where, it depends on where you're at and I actually say that I get people that email me a lot like what books do you recommend and I'm like it totally depends on where you're at on your journey because The Power of Now was like a huge book for me I read it when I was like 22 I actually want to reread it like 10 years later and see you know how I feel about it I think it's one of those books that you get like more from it each time you read it or yeah. depending on where you're at you kind of hear more and feel more into it but it does. It depends on, you know, what other books you've already read, how open you are, you know, what you're most interested in at that time. What? What is this? Oh, my God. It's a new segment we've got called What's the Rock Up To? <laughs> does this mean that I should have been listening to your podcast to know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is the second time I've done it. Um, it's not. This is a little bit different. It's not What the Rock's Up To as much as um, progressing on my journey to get the rock on the show do you know this did, um, I, did no, I tell you about this so i remember hearing something about so i don't even know anything about him at all um i almost just said like what's the rock <laughs> what's the rock <laughs> but i do get know out. i think dad told me you wanted to do a documentary or follow him around or something like that yeah well that was an idea i had was like oh it would be cool to do it to do a documentary with the rock and i think maybe that's when my um kind of that's when i where this idea stemmed from uh that has been an idea like yeah maybe it might be cool down the road uh but obviously that's that's a way crazier idea i think a bigger commitment but this is still pretty crazy to get the rock to sit in that chair in front yeah. of me on like in my apartment or wherever the hell it happens to be um to to interview the rock on this podcast is one of my big goals i'm striving to to do and i do have a big update i got an email today okay i'm not gonna from a former guest on the show and he's got contact details from the rocks team really yeah he worked on a movie with the rock um he's got his business partner and producer phone number email what does and, it say over top and, of that document it's like the watermark. Uh, yeah, because I think this is was. Like, I think this is like the call sheet for the. <laughs> I don't think he was supposed to send me. I this. don't think so. It has a water big watermark on. No, it. I mean I, I think that's. It's not like a watermark. Is in don't send this to other people. That's probably just the design, like the the design mm, of the call sheet. Maybe. So what you're going to contact? Whew, I don't know, man. I don't know what to do with this now. I got this information. I got email. I got phone numbers. Um, we got assistance and his part business partner. Holy shit! You got to send them like a little segment, like a little clip. Of this, like of yeah. one of your things where you're talking about having him on and send it to them. Yeah. I think that that's, uh, I don't know if that's going to work though. Well, you try, but this is a good way of doing it. I'm like, there's something that I can't remember who it was, but somebody did something like this where it was like a public camp. I think they made a movie. Wasn't it Drew Barrymore? Oh, my date with Drew. Yeah. Like, didn't he like publicly start talking about like wanting to go on a date with her or something? And then all these people started to like yeah. help him yeah, get maybe, connected. Ooh, I should probably get that guy on the podcast. I think he's from LA. The, yeah. The, the my date was, with Drew. And then based in LA. yeah, maybe he can. This is like my date with the rock. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. But I, I guess what I could ask you is what, what advice would you give me uh, to get The Rock on the show? What, how should I go about it? Because I don't want to be too eager and I don't want to, if I have these contacts now mm -hmm. that I could reach out to, but is it too soon? It, too like, soon. I'm, and I'm only 20 episodes in. Uh, I don't have a big following. Do I go for it right now? Nobody seems to care. I've never heard somebody, nobody tweeted at me about The Rock yet. So I don't even know if people <laughs> are listening or under, are what, following have you been this. tweeting about it? No, I just bring it up in every episode. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's never too soon, you know, because it's like you can always ask again later if they're like, you're not big enough yet or whatever. You can always ask again, but definitely do it now. Why not? You got good quality content. I've got to get a bigger chair. <laughs> yeah, he'd be sitting on two of yeah, these right now. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. I'll get a bench for the rock. Um, and so you, you don't even know much about the rock. You said what's no? What's I don't a think rock? I've seen any movies with him. <sighs> Dude, he's the biggest movie star in the world. No, he's not the biggest. I mean, yeah. I know he. What do the you mean? High, the highest biggest? grossing. He is absolutely. I, when the, within the past couple of years, he was. Uh, I think it was 2016 or so. Yeah, he was the highest grossing movie Shit. star in the world. 
This guy went from WWE to being one of the highest. Oh, he was in WWE. Yeah. He, are <laughs> you kidding? I don't know anything about him. Like, I know what he looks like. And that's pretty much it. You have. I'm not into, like, wow. those action movies. So I don't think there's anything he's it been in. It doesn't matter. Why do you like him so much? Oh, God. Everybody asks me this question. <laughs> and, and Everybody's confused by it. It doesn't make any sense. He's the... His journey... He like he he was trying to be a, a pro football player, got an injury. Um, his father and grandfather were both wrestling stars, but nowhere to the level of, of, of him and, and what he was able to accomplish. He he rose to the top of the WWE, became this massive celebrity um, in pop culture and through wrestling. And then he makes this transition to doing film, where he does the Scorpion King. Uh, it's a spinoff of The Mummy with Brendan mm-hmm. Fraser, if you remember, and propels him into superstardom. And he, like, that was so long ago. And he's still, and like, those are pretty bad movies. And he's he's worked his ass off. Mm-hmm. And you look at this guy where, like, by all measures of the imagination, he has made it. And this is what everybody gets obsessed about is like, like, oh, I just want to make it. They just keep striving to climb the corporate ladder or to make enough money to eventually the point where they can be happy. And he has clearly gotten to the point where most people would want, but he works harder than anybody in show business, anybody, period. Uh, he busts his ass. He wakes up at like 5 a.m. He's got the rock clock, <sighs> uh, which is uh, an app on the uh, a, a, an alarm clock app where you can actually set to wake up with the rock every morning. What? Yeah, it's a little bit creepy. But basically, it, like, he uses his alarm clock and it mm-hmm. sends that data to everybody else. So it's like the rock's waking up at 5 a.m. this morning. The rock's waking up at 4.30 a.m. this morning. Um, but you just see, like, this guy hustles. And he doesn't have to. He could sit at home in his mansion and just do whatever he wants. But he busts his ass. He, he works out like a machine. His, his uh, diet is unbelievable, the amount of calories he eats. There was this reporter that tried to eat the same amount of food he does, which the guy shouldn't have because he's so scrawny, and <laughs> he was throwing up by 12 uh. p.m. Um, and through all of that, he just seems like the most humble, nice, down-to-earth mm. guy you could imagine, always takes time for fans, and uh, he just seems like a really good, genuine dude. And I'd be interested in hearing his that story and delving into that yeah. and understanding. He uh, inspires you. Yeah, I think that there's like hearing you talk about his like basically commitment to life or like dedication to like himself. I think that people you tend to hear that when you're inspired by somebody like they you know they do this thing that seems like maybe almost impossible to us or or it's something that we really aspire to. Um, that's always cool. I mean, I love when people have like like motivation for life because mm-hmm. because so many str- so many people struggle with I, I remember people always saying to me just about running my own business I could never do that I could never do that like we have this belief a lot of times that we have to like have other people give us structure for you know but it's like all of this is made up like, you know culture the way you know going to school and going to work it's like we're all like making it up we have this yeah. idea of like it has a certain pathway and that what is what feels easiest to just show up on at the time people tell us to show up but i think there's so much um it feels really good when you actually create it yourself and you're showing up for it just because you're choosing to that's great i completely I'm on board with you there, and I think this is a good time to do the final segment. Okay. I didn't even know you had segments. You're yeah. legit. Yeah, pretty cool, cool right? Yeah. This is um, called Quick Questions. Are you, you have some pre-prepared questions for me? I do. These are questions that I ask everybody. Okay. Um, I choose... It's not always the same questions I ask everybody, but I, I kind of direct them towards the people I think are going to be able to provide the most value to the audience. All right. So question number one, what drives you? Oh, wow. That was a perfect segue. Um, What drives me? That's such a vague question. Um, I'll answer the way that uh, I feel about it is my soul. So I've always had this feeling in me that I describe that I would describe as my soul or that resonates with me as my soul. So it's this feeling of like, you need to express this. You need to write this. I've always been creative. Um, I mean, 
you know, we were kids. We were like making little movies and I was writing scripts and writing little books and making songs. So I think there's always been this feeling in me that just wants to create. Um, and then there's also another feeling that like wants it to feel purposeful. And so for me, it's all about just kind of satisfying that feeling within me, that feeling of my soul, my soul calling. Let's say that somebody's stuck and they don't know which direction to head. What advice would you give them to do today to help them get unstuck? Breath work. And if you were going to tell them just to do breath work, how would you encourage them to get started? Um, I have an audio on my website that they can use um, that will give them literally just press play and lay down and start breathing and things will start to open up and you can take it from there. But I think that um, if you're feeling stuck in any area of your life, it's a really powerful tool to start to open yourself up to recognizing what is it that's keeping you stuck. And um, yeah. I mean, I work with people to like kind of give them more tools, but it it usually has to do with what specifically they're stuck with. And how do you face doubt? Self-doubt. I mean, I think that a big part of my journey has been about letting go of self-doubt and and learning to love myself and value myself. So again, breathwork has really been the tool that's helped me do that, helped me connect more and more deeply to myself. I don't think I have any really like specific things that I like, that I do if I'm like doubting myself. Usually like if I'm stuck making a decision, um, it's like just kind of make the decision to move on. I'll feel like I'm resisting in some ways. Um, Like that will sort of start to keep myself stuck. But I don't have any like big profound way aside from like breathing and and just part of it being my journey of learning to um, value myself, value my worth. What one skill have you leveraged in a way that you think others haven't? Ooh, damn. These are hard questions that others haven't. Well, I mean, the skill I would say that I have developed as like a, an entrepreneur has really helped me. I don't know. I, I wouldn't say that like others haven't necessarily, but I will say like doing the work that I've done. So like having been an entrepreneur from a very young age, owning a denim store, you know, when I was right out of college and then creating a graphic design business, owning a clothing line. Like I've had so many different experiences that have not worked in a lot of ways. And that's actually helped shape my ability to run Pushing Beauty in a way that's really serving me. Um, And then also having a a graphic design background, like I just wrote a book and I designed the cover and I designed the interior of it and laid it out. And so it's like, I actually have a lot of skills that are helping me um, move forward with my business in a way that looks professional, but also, you know, isn't keeping me stuck in terms of like needing to hire a lot of people to do different things because I can do it myself. Yeah. I think it gives you a lot of power and that's the same thing with the podcast and uh, the video stuff that I do, it's if, if I had to hire somebody to do all this stuff, if you have to hire a graphic designer to do all the work, uh, for your website, it would, and for your book, it would be challenging Mm -hmm. to, cause then you, you have to come from the mindset of this needs to be profitable. I need to actually make my money back on this thing. I can't keep spending thousands of dollars on this. So yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Develop some skills that are going to help you in, in your journey that will outlive that specific, um, skill, if that makes sense. So like if you learn how to be a graphic designer to serve clients later on, you can use that superpower to serve yourself. Yeah. And so much about people's experience, like on my website, for example, like they're, they're hanging out on my website, reading articles. And so I can, I've created in a way that feels good to spend time there. Like it feels really shitty to be on a website that doesn't look good or doesn't work the right way too. Like you click on things and it doesn't bring you where it's supposed to bring you, or things are just kind of disorganized. Like it doesn't feel very good. You're not going to spend a lot of time there. So, um, yeah, I think, I, ad- I judge people by yeah. the website. It's like if somebody reaches out to me and says like, because usually, you know, I'll get a few emails a week where people are like, hey, I really love the documentary. 
like uh, would love it if you checked out some of my work or checked out this and that and I, I usually like or sometimes they don't even do that but they have the email where they have their website attached to the end of it mm-hmm. and I'll copy and paste it and just to see if they're legit sometimes I do that before I even read the email I'll just be like alright is it legit and legit is yeah. is it nicely designed is yep. it thoughtful uh, if it's just if it's a filmmaker I'll just play their reel that to me mm-hmm. is is just the same form as a nicely designed website it's a professionalism like are that yeah are they legit are they professional i'll click on people's things too to see like you know how what what is the quality of of their work how are they presenting themselves what mindset do you need to have to make it to make it i don't even believe in making it i think that's bullshit um but i would say what mindset do you have to um to be happy or to, uh, I mean, I think it's, it's that it's actually redefining for yourself what it means to make it, what it, and that's essentially another way of saying to be successful. So I'm sure a lot of your listeners are like more like entrepreneurs and maybe creating their own businesses or aspiring to create their own business. And I even get a lot of my clients who are, a lot of people feel this feeling of like, there's something that I want to make that's my own. Um, and I would say the mindset would be to, believe in yourself, um, to trust yourself, to believe in your worth and your value, and that um, you have something unique to offer every single human being. I think we get really caught up in, um, I just wrote actually a little Instagram post about this, like we get really caught up in comparing ourselves to other people or saying like, I don't have enough experience. I don't have like, I I haven't studied this enough. I don't know all of the answers here or whatever. So we get really fearful and like putting ourselves out there. And I think, um, the more you can trust that, like wherever you're at, you have something to teach somebody. We are all teachers. We're all students. Uh, one more question. And then we'll wrap it up. I know you got dinner plans. You got a pool get, party. You got a pool party? Yeah. LA. LA. It's beautiful to be in this city. <laughs> this beautiful city of LA, Los Angeles. Um, one thing for people to read before they go to bed tonight. The first thing that came to mind for me was actually a poem, but I don't remember what it's called. So I'm not going to be able <laughs> wow, to give wait, that one. That's it. That's all we got. That's all the time we've got for this episode of the Ground Up Show. Thank you guys so much for listening or for watching. Uh, This is a temporary setup. I'm here in the dining room of uh, my new LA apartment, but we'll be upgrading soon to a bigger studio. Uh, If you want to try out breathwork, if you're interested in Michelle's work, go to pushingbeauty.com. Yeah. Twitter. Uh, Yeah. Michelle Diavella, but I'm not Twitter that much. Instagram. Instagram. Pushing Beauty. Pinterest. Pinterest, Pushing Beauty, or Michelle Devil, I'm not sure. Facebook? Facebook is Pushing Beauty now. Just Google Michelle Diavella Breathwork. Yeah, or just go to PushingBeauty.com. Uh, or go to PushingBeauty.com. PushingBeauty.com. That's probably the easiest thing, yeah. right? Just go to PushingBeauty.com. Uh, thank you for being on the show, being my first interview in LA. For being your sister. Thank you for being my sister and being there and always supporting me. Oh, thank encouraging you. encouraging me. Likewise. Okay, that's it. We're done with the show. All right. <laughs> Hey, Ground Up listeners, thanks for tuning in. If you've been keeping up with my work, you know I've been working on a 20-minute film called Unstuck, The Five Steps to Change. It's my personal story of paying off over $100,000 in student loan debt, as well as the lessons I learned from our 25-plus interviews in minimalism. The film is finished, but it's only for my email subscribers. So sign up for my newsletter at mattdevella.com. I don't send out that many emails, probably about one a month, maybe less. Uh, So it's only when I have really great stuff to share. Check it out. Watch the film. Let me know what you think. And thanks again for listening.